Radiance here. Today, we are going to dive into implementing an effective onboarding flow within a React application. There are many ways to onboard users, but we'll focus on a method that has proven to be highly effective. This approach involves redirecting users to a dedicated onboarding page where they'll go through a series of steps. Each step is designed to educate users about a specific feature or concept and connect their problem with the solution your app provides. You can experience the final result by signing up at Increaser, and you can find all the reusable components and utilities we'll discuss in the Resident Kit repository. Onboarding is crucial for increasing user retention and engagement. After completing the onboarding process, users should feel invested in your application and understand how to use it to solve their problems or achieve their goals. With this in mind, it's important to carefully select the best format for onboarding flow. Some apps use tooltips, but this might not be as effective or engaging. Others opt for a series of models, which also don't provide the best experience since they follow the same principle as a dedicated page, but with a smaller space to work with. To redirect users to the onboarding page, we use a component called requires onboarding. This component checks if the user has completed the onboarding process and redirect them to the onboarding page if they haven't. We don't wrap every page with this component because certain pages should be accessible without completing the onboarding flow. For example, consider a user who purchased a lifetime version of the app elsewhere. In this scenario, they will follow a link that takes them to a code redemption page and they should be able to complete the product activation without going through the onboarding flow. We store the finished onboarding ad value in the database along with other user information. This value is updated when the user completes the last step of the onboarding process through a regular update user procedure. If you're curious about managing backend APIs within TypeScript Monorepo, check out the corresponding YouTube video on my channel. Our onboarding page, like other pages within the app, is wrapped with the user state only component. This component ensures that the user is authenticated and redirects them to the login page if they're not. It also waits until the user state is loaded before rendering its children. At Increaser, we use a comprehensive query to retrieve nearly all the necessary user data. Also, this query is blocking, users typically experience negligible delays thanks to efficient caching of user data in local storage through React Query. This strategy ensures that the app's functionality is readily accessible upon subsequent launches, providing a seamless user experience. To facilitate the development of the onboarding flow and maintain organized state management, we use the onboarding provider component. Its state includes the current step of the onboarding process an array of steps that the user has already completed, a string containing the reason why the next step is disabled or false if the next step is enabled, and a function used to navigate between steps. Currently, the app has seven onboarding steps, but this number may change in the future. We derive the onboarding step union type from the onboarding steps array, which maintains all the steps in an ordered list. Additionally, we define the onboarding step target name object that maps each step to a string describing the target of that step. This mapping is used to display a title for each step. When the consumer of the provider changes the current step, we do more than just update the state. We also find the previous step and add it to the completed steps array, which we use to highlight the user's progress in the onboarding flow UI. Additionally, it's important to have a final report in our analytics so we track every completed step. We use the index of the step instead of the name because we can change the step name or reorder steps and we don't want that to affect our analytics. Since every step of the onboarding process alters the user state, which is stored in a single context, we can easily determine if a particular step is disabled. Currently, there is only one step that requires user input there must be at least one project added. This is because the app's most important functionality, time tracking, is not available without it. Other steps either have default values or correspond to features that do not affect the app's core functionality. We use the match function from writing key to map the current step to a validator function that returns a string if the step is disabled. This pattern is similar to the switch case, but is more convenient. 
You will also see the match component later, which applied the same principle but for rendering the appropriate component. To track the completion of the onboarding flow in analytics and set the finished onboarding ad field in the database, we use a use effect hook that watches for changes in the current step. When the current step becomes the last one and it's not disabled, it indicates that the user has completed the onboarding flow. To make it more convenient for consumers of the provider to access the state, we provide the use onboarding hook, which is created with the create contacts hook utility. This utility receives the onboarding contacts and the name of the contents as arguments and returns a hook that throws an error if the contacts is not provided. Now let's return to the onboarding page. Since we aim to utilize the available screen space effectively, we implement a conditional rendering based on screen width. For small screens, we use the small screen onboarding component and for normal screens, we use the normal screen onboarding component. We'll start with the desktop version first as it's more important for web apps like ours where users more frequently start using the app on a desktop rather than on a mobile device. Our layout here is a three column grid. The first column contains an overview of the onboarding flow, which won't take up much space. The second column contains the most important part of the onboarding flow, where the user will input the data required for the current step. The third column contains educational content that explains the concept behind the current step. To visually separate the columns, we give the first column a background color with less contrast than the other two columns, as the user will interact less with this section compared to the others. Additionally, we add a dash border between the second and third column. The onboarding overview component aims to show the user's progress and allow navigation between steps. In the title of the section, we display the number of completed steps out of the total number of steps, highlighting it in green. In the body of the section, we iterate over each step and display it using the onboarding progress item component. To determine if a step is completed, current or enabled, we use the data provided by the onboarding provider through the use onboarding hook. The onboarding progress item component displays an indicator of step completion next to the step name. The indicator is a gray circle that contains a check icon at the center when the step is completed. The primary part of the onboarding page is the onboarding step form component. Here we reuse the onboarding section component to maintain a consistent layout across all three sections of the page. To display the title of the current step, we use the onboarding step target name object that we saw earlier. This ensures that the title will be the same as in the corresponding progress item in the overview section. In the footer, we display the onboarding primary navigation, which contains the back and next buttons. The back button is visible for every step except the first one. The next button is always visible, but it will be disabled if the is next step disabled value is not false, and it will display a tooltip with the reason for the disability. When clicking on the next button, the set current step function is called with the next step as an argument. If the current step is the last one, the next button will redirect the user to the home page. The onboarding step form content components match the current step to the appropriate interactive content. This is achieved using the match component, which is a part of Horizon Kit. We won't delve into the details of each step, but let's take a look at the project's onboarding step component as an example. It consists of two sections, a form for adding a new project and a list of added projects. When there are no projects, we display an informational block that encourages the user to add at least one project. Each action made in this component is reflected in the global state and the database, ensuring that if the user leaves the onboarded page and returns, they will see the same state as before. Additionally, we strive to keep the UI on the onboarding page as simple as possible. Once the user adds a project, they can only delete it, as supporting project editing would make the UI more complex. There is no data loss if the user deletes something on the onboarding page because they haven't started using the app yet. The last section of the onboarding page is the onboarding step education component. Here we use titles that are different from those in the overview and form sections to make them more encouraging and informative. The content of this section has three parts a video, a textbook, and extra content that depends on the current step. For now, this additional content is only applicable to the daily habits step. 
where we display a list of curated habits that the user can add to their daily habits with a single click. To better explain the app's concept, we also have a video for each step. Each video is relatively short, around one minute long, where I try to persuade the user to complete the step because it will help them become more productive or enhance their lifestyle. The only exception is the last video, which is from Andrew Huberman's podcast. In this video, he explained the value of 90-minute work sessions and how to focus better. The onboarding video prompt component displays a panel prompting the user to watch a video to learn more. The panel is interactive. When the user hovers over it, the background and text color change. Upon clicking the panel, it expands to reveal the video, and a close button appears in the top right corner, making only the button interactive. Clicking the close button collapses the panel back to its original state. To make the component more generic, it doesn't assume how the video will be displayed. Instead, it expects a function in its props that will render the video. To render the video, we use the React Player library. We manage the ease playing state with the use boolean hook. To provide the correct size for the YouTube video player, we rely on the element size aware component to measure the available width and calculate the height based on the 916 ratio, which is the default aspect ratio for YouTube videos. Since all the components involved in the onboarding process are responsive and flexible, we can also construct a mobile version of the onboarding page. In this version, we omit the progress and education sections, displaying only the form section. However, if you want to add some additional content, you can easily integrate collapsible sections or tabs. Uh, the container we use the model component, which is a part of Ryzen Kit. It will occupy the entire space on small screens while keeping the title and footers always visible and making the content scrollable. That's all. If you found the video useful, please like and subscribe.